Welcome to Digitopia, the event where electricity meets data. My name is Bruce Douglas. I'm the Director of Communications and Business at Euroelectric. And thank you for joining along with 600 other participants. Please join the debate on social media using at Euroelectric and hashtag Digitopia and Electric Decade. Today's event is the culmination of phase two of our Beyond Digital platform, which is our initiative to bring together technology utility and other companies to unlock the potential of AI and digitalization in the power sector. I'd like to extend a big thanks to the members of the platform. As you can see on the screen, some of the leaders in the technology and power sectors. The planning is now underway for phase three. So next year. So please do get in touch uh, with us if you'd like to join and know more. Also, a big thanks to the supporters of this Digitopia event, particularly to SAS, Google Cloud, Landis and Gear, and Microsoft. And as a unique collaborative extension of Digitopia, today we are co-hosting a physical pitching session of Energy Innovations with Initiate at Enlit in Milan. So the electric decade has begun, and we are on the verge of a fifth industrial revolution, a revolution powered by clean, decarbonized electricity, a revolution leading to net zero emissions in transport, buildings and industries. As the world becomes increasingly electric, digital technologies must be rapidly deployed to unlock the potential of decarbonisation in the power sector. Now, Euroelectric considers digitalisation as an integral part of the energy transition, as it is changing how we supply and purchase energy and interact with the customers as well as the pathways we can take towards decarbonizing European economies. To meet the ambitions of the twin green and digital transition, we need better functioning, smarter, more integrated and resilient data and power networks. So what can you expect during the event? Well, in the opening session, we're delighted to have Mr. Leonard Birnbaum, CEO and Chairman of the Board at E.ON, also Vice President of Euroelectric, to discuss with Euroelectric's Policy Director Henning Heider. He'll be discussing the strategies undertaken by major European utilities such as E.ON to harness the full potential of digital technologies in their quest for customer engagement, lower costs and climate neutrality. After that, we'll host two panel debates on key topics enabling an inclusive, reliable and secure twin transition. The first panel will address the potential of cloud-based technologies to empower citizens, companies and economies to achieve carbon neutrality well before 2050. The preeminence of cloud-based technologies will persist as regulations and initiatives facilitate data inter interoperability, integration, business models and operations to move towards greater decentralization and resilience. In the second panel session, representatives of the energy sector, tech companies and EU institutions will discuss cybersecurity risk management tools, facilitating greater system resilience, as well as the framework needed to further strengthen cybersecurity across sectors. I look forward to today's captivating presentations and insightful exchanges. Now, don't forget to join the debate on our social media at your electric with the hashtags Digitopia and Electric Decade. I'm now delighted to welcome our first speaker and Vice President of Euroelectric, Mr. Leonard Birnbaum. Over to you, Henning. Good morning, everybody, also from my side. Um, I'm very excited to have the opportunity to pick the brain of a man who is not just uh, leading one of uh, the sector's most ambitiously innovative companies, but at the same time also our very own Vice President of Euroelectric, CEO of E.ON, Leonard Birnbaum. Leo, good morning. Thanks for taking the time. Good morning. Thank you. Um, now, we, of course, today at Digitopia, we are focusing on the European level, but um, I don't want to miss the opportunity to also hear from you yourself and your own shop. Now, I know that just last week, and some of our viewers might know as well, you just launched Aeon's new strategy at the Capital Markets Day. And I had a sneak peek and I saw that one of the three key pillars that you are promoting going forward is actually digitalization. So I'd be keen to hear before we go into the, the rest of the topics, what's your tackling? How do you want to approach it? Uh, what's your strategy? Yeah, um, the three themes uh, for me start with growth. Because what we're really looking at is the energy transition, which is ahead of us, and the energy transi transition 
is really the key for making climate action a success. Now, um, to be successful in the energy tra transition, we need to massively invest into uh, renewables, e-mobility, transformation of industries, but more than anything else into the underlying infrastructure. And what we presented is uh, that we will massively invest more into our energy network infrastructure as the backbone of the energy transition and into customer solutions as a way for our customers to decarbonize. Now, obviously this is driven by, and that's my second topic, uh, the quest for sustainability, which is the driver behind this growth. But what is really making it possible that such a, a system works in the future, what is really tying together the decarbonization, uh, decarbonization solutions of our customers with the uh, overall energy system, that's digitization. Without digitization, we cannot possibly, possibly manage the systems uh, which we have to manage. We cannot possibly provide the flexibility which we need, and we cannot possibly make it possible for our customers to be successful on their journey. So this is why digitization is the third pillar of our strategy next to growth and sustainability. Thanks for these insights. Thanks a lot. I also saw that you announced that Aeon plans to be the first all digital energy company. I think that is a very ambitious and interesting uh, claim and I'll be curious to see how you implement it. Now, what you just mentioned in the pillars is sustainability, digitalization and growth, I think they perfectly ensemble the challenge that you tackle as, as Aeon, but I think they would also make really great headlines at what we're trying to tackle and achieve at European level, so to speak. So we are accelerating the energy transition, the power sector has moved to center stage to be the key enabler here, um, and I would say that the key implementing factor for that is the Fit for 55 package, the big legislative uh, um, wave that's currently going through the European institutions. Um, now, when you took your electrics head as vice president this summer, the package was just about to be released. And now it's been four or five months in which you could follow this from both Aeon's perspective and both from your electrics vice presidency perspective. Taking into consideration what you've learned, what you've seen in this time, how do you see uh, the key elements to implement and to achieve this accelerated transition? Well, maybe it's fair to start that overall, both your electric, but also E.ON, uh, welcome the Fit for 55 package. We see it in, in total as a step into the right direction. Uh, it's a very ambitious step, uh, but uh, it's the right step. And we have been also very vocal on a European level as Euroelectric, but also myself in my company role uh, with supporting comments. Uh, the combination um, of good instruments, carbon pricing, higher targets, uh, revision of the directives etc., where necessary, that makes all sense and, uh, and it's, it's, it's positive. Now, we nevertheless have some comments uh, which we have discussed in the Euroelectric board but which I have been also uh, you know, openly uh, uh, named at uh, several occasions when there were public events. Um, first, I lack the focus on infrastructure. It's too much generation focused, but in the end, we're seeing it, for example, in e-mobility, if we do not have the infrastructure which allows us to integrate the decarbonization options of our customers, which allows us to integrate the renewables, it's not going to be an efficient and effective energy transition. And we have used up the reserves in the system uh, as the Euroelectric study on the DSOs has clearly shown. So what we would hope for is a, a, str a stronger recognition of the roles of the underlying infrastructure. And that, for example, could be done in the Renewable Energy Directive. Now, I understand that that one is focused on renewables, but uh, I give you one example. In Eastern Germany, we are looking at uh, areas where we have a peak of two, an installed base of uh, six gigawatts of renewables, and we are have, having now a connection requests of 30 gigawatts. If, oh, if even only half of that is being built, the system will just not be able to cope with it. Yeah. And so, that this could be something that could be more acknowledged on the Fit for 55 uh, level. A second comment I would like to make is um, there is a certain temptation on a national level, but also on a European level, to over-regulate everything. <laughs> and for example, um, I believe that some things will happen without regulation. 
a coal exit, nobody in Europe is going to build a new coal station. You don't need regulation for that. Uh, same on combustion engine, by the way. Yeah, uh, I think it's actually even counterproductive to even have this discussion. We will see an accelerating trend towards e-mobility anyway. Um, but uh, the, the same, we are seeing an example in the Energy Efficiency Directive. We have a detailed regulation, uh, regulation of grid losses. I think that's even that's even wrong because if I integrate more renewables in the area which I just described, my losses will go up by definition. But these will be all green losses. So actually, there's nothing I can do about it. I even try to increase losses so that I can integrate more renewables. So that's one example. And if, by the way, if I stick to the efficiency directive, I'll just integrate less renewables. Yeah. So what's better? And um, third one, uh, we, we should have a higher focus on securing the capital for uh, investments. And uh, there's a certain tendency to believe that capital is abundant. It comes either from European pots or it comes at uh, zero interest rate. This is not a long-term approach to a trillion euro investment program. We should just make sure that we provide the possibility to earn margins which allow the investments and don't rely on continued subsidies and continued subsidi cross-subsidization of state support. Well, um, I think that was all critical, but again, I see it all positive because the more aggressive Fit for 55 is, the more investment opportunities I have as a utility. Yeah. So for me, it's great, but we need to do it. We owe it to our customers and our societies to do it the right way. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's that's a very good way of putting it. Um, and that certainly also reflects what we're seeing and what we're discussing here in Brussels in the context of the package, currently with the parliament, with the council, but also with our peers and our, our competitors here. The investment climate is critical, getting the right numbers out. Now, you just mentioned the investment needs for grid specifically, also referring to the study that we did earlier this year, connecting the dots. Um, I want to tie this into the Digitopia discussion a little bit because the numbers that we've come up there is basically, you know, increasing investments 50, 70 percent per year in order to get just to modernize our grids to be able to take on the renewable volumes that you just mentioned. But critically, they will also enable us to digitalize the grid. And this is where I would ask you the next question is, what does that grid look like from your perspective? Um, how are the, what are the key pillars and how does that grid look like um, going into 2025, 2030 to enable us to really make the best of it? Well, um, we have announced in the Capital Market Day that in energy networks only we're increasing our digitization investments to three to 400 million per year only for networks. Now, that number is difficult to grab because somehow digital should be part of every investment we make. I'll give you an example. I could put in a dump local substation or I can put in one which has a sensor, is connected and can be controlled remotely. Now, that's just a few percentage points more cost. So it's not that we're talking huge sums, but it, I would say in the long run, somehow digital should be part of every investment we make. Or if we put a cable into the, into, into the ground, you can put a dump cable in, or you can put a cable in which has a fiber attached to it so that you can send some signals. Yeah? So every investment should be smart in the future. That's number one. And why? Because in the end, we need to digitize the full infrastructure which we have. And we need to connect the customers with the infrastructure. So it's not only regulated, unregulated, it's actually a whole energy system. And the whole energy system will span additional industries. It will span towards steel, towards hydrogen, towards heating, towards mobility. Now, the complexity of this future system where we have millions and really millions of participants interacting with each other can only be managed if we have it fully digitized. This is why we want to be an all digital company. And we said it, we need to be it on the network side mm -hmm. and on the customer solution side. And then we said, yeah, that means we're all digital or we just can't do our job anymore. Interesting. No, thank you. That's a perspective that I think provides also good input and good elements for today's discussions in the, in the panels following the interview. Um, if I may say so, sure. um, um, just one comment. If you're not fully digital, probably you are not around anymore in a few years. So 
it's a challenge not only for us, it's a challenge for everybody. Thanks. Yeah, that's, I, I sign up to that completely. And I think that's also a good bridge to the final question that I would bring to you. So I want to stay on digitalization here um, and zoom out a little bit, if you allow me, beyond energy networks. I think no one would dispute that for some time now, technological developments have massively outpaced the regulatory framework. For the electricity sector, this has been a challenging time because they have not been digital champions and they're still finding the time to prioritize and to galvanize really what they want to achieve because they sit on a lot of value in the digital realm. Now, it all comes down to data, in my opinion. It comes down to availability, to standardization, but it also comes down to what we as the power sector will ultimately be able to tell regulators because it cannot stay in this imbalance going forward. So my question would be to you, um, how do you think or what are the key measures that we as the electricity sector should be put forward to the regulators in order to get that balance straight, to catch some regulation, but at the same time allow the technological developments? Yeah, um, it's a difficult question because the development is so fast in this area. Mm. But for exactly that reason, my first answer would be don't, don't give us regulation which is not technology agnostic. Uh, we should have regulation which is technology agnostic so that we can adapt to it and, and even worse, that we are not forced to do the wrong things. The second one is um, each regulation, whatever regulation, whatever uh, standards, whatever boundary conditions are being put in place, doesn't need to be only regulation, yeah, um, should acknowledge um, that complexity and speed uh, are two topics which we need to take care of. The complexity should be as low as possible. Mm. Right, probably it's going to be complex, but you shouldn't make it complicated unnecessarily, if I may make that distinction, and therefore allow us to be fast. We have a tendency, especially in Europe, for example, on data protection, to put rules into place where we then, as a result, struggle immensely to come up with good solutions. Yeah. And it's not that no data protection is possible, but sometimes a pragmatic approach can enable us to do much more as an energy industry and to provide much better services than a, I call it dogmatic approach. And partially, I have to say, I'm observing dogmatic approaches on the regulatory side, not only in Europe, but also on a member state level. The third comment is, it would be extremely helpful if standards which we have are truly European standards. What's really hard to cope with is um, data protection standards, which are different on all national levels. And being German, I criticize the Germans the most. Yeah? I think the Germans are the worst when it comes to that, because we always add on top, and that just doesn't help. Yeah. We should have European standards, which are okay for everybody, but if somebody has the perspective, um, I don't care about Europe, it has to be my way, or I, I just do it on top of whatever Europe is doing, then we have no European markets. And then markets like the US, like Asia, will always be faster, and they will actually set the standards that we should not allow. So technology neutrality, speed versus uh, uh, avoiding unnecessary complications. Complexity is fine, it's inherent, but complications are unnecessary. And then uh, allow us, uh, give us the data which we need. And one wonderful example, and this one is Germany, where, where we get no smart meter rollout. Because of all of these three, we are not technology agnostic. We are complicated like hell. Speed doesn't play a role, and data protection is uh, paramount, and as a result, we get nothing done. Thanks for that, and thanks for your honesty and these insights here. I think I agree with you. The European solution is absolutely necessary to stay competitive globally. Um, a lot of the topics you just, uh, just uh, touched upon will be taken on later by the panels as well. Um, and your lecture is certainly going to stay engaged here. Now, Leo, as much as I would love to continue discussing with you and pick your brain on digitalization um, and your views as Vice President and as Aon CEO, it's now time for us to close the interview and to move forward by going to the next panel discussion, uh, moderated by Francis Robinson, where we focus on cloud-driven infrastructure and services. 
I want to thank you once again for taking the time today, for your critical and insightful answers, and I know that your guidance as VP at Euroelectric is going to be very, very useful in moving us as an industry forward. So thank you once again, Leo, and talk soon. And it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Digitopia 2021, where electricity meets data. My name is Francis Robinson. I'm a freelance journalist. And I'm delighted to be moderating our first panel today on how cloud-driven infrastructure and services will enable carbon neutrality. Europe is at a crossroads. As the world faces new commitments on carbon neutrality, how can cloud infrastructure and services support the objectives of the European Green Deal and get us all carbon neutral well before 2050? How will cloud infrastructure and services affect the way Europe's energy providers operate in the future? And what could the future of cloud governance look like? We've got a great lineup to discuss these issues today. I'll start by introducing our speakers, then we'll hear two keynotes before opening the debate up to the panel. Time is tight, so I'd urge all of the speakers to keep their interventions short and to the point. And I'd invite all of you watching and listening to you join the debate online using the hashtags Digitopia and hashtag Electric Decade. The idea of Digitopia is to throw forward thinking on data, artificial intelligence and digitalization in the energy sector. So it would be a shame if today's discussion just stayed in the virtual room. Please get sharing. Today's keynote speakers are Larry Cochran, who is Director of Global Energy Solutions at Google Cloud, and Antonio Hidalgo, Vice President of Digital Solutions at Landis and Gear. We'll then be joined in the panel session by Max Lemke, who is Head of Unit for Internet of Things at the EU Commission's DG Connect, Mary O'Connor, who's Chief Information Officer at ESB, the Irish Vertically Integrated Utility Operator, Fatih Balieli, who is CEO and co-founder of Exile, which provides cloud-based supercomputing and blockchain as a service, and Carol davis Fuller, who is Associate Director of Sustainability and Technology at Accenture. We've got a great range of perspectives there. I'm looking forward to hearing their insights, and I'm sure you are too. Antonio, where do you like to kick things off with today's first keynote? Thank you very much for your, for your kind introduction. So, Let's talk about, you know, it is really a pleasure for Landis and Gia and myself uh, to be running this keynote in this panel. So let's talk about the energy transition and how cloud-based technologies can help uh, for this, uh, you know, for this journey. I think, you know, we all know that the traditional power grid system was constructed in a centralized and radial topology, where power is generated and delivered from one end to the other. With the emergence of the distributed energy resources, DER, the conventional method for unidirectional power flow analysis will no longer be effective for control purposes. So new active grid control strategies are needed to facilitate the bidirectional flow incurred by power production of the DER assets. On the other hand, the transition to a decarbonized society is empowering citizens to interact with the energy market as consumers. So the integration of consumers also impose new considerations in designing unified and sustainable frameworks for efficient use of the grid infrastructure. This transformation in the end requires intelligent distribution automation by means of a decentralized power management, as well as information and communication technologies, new and innovative ICT technologies to help with the smart grid modernization. In this context, what are the key challenges that we are facing to succeed with the energy transition? So the expectations are that uh, the different market agents, including regulators and policy makers, hmm, will be able to find the right strategy and technology solutions that enable accessible, affordable, secure, competitive, and sustainable energy for all Europeans. However, the increased electricity usage, the proliferation of DER assets, EV cars, PV panels, microgrids, all of these can lead to network congestion and imbalance on the distribution grid. There are quite many challenges. So just to name a few of them. So Let's start with the security of supply, you know, and usual consumption patterns may affect to the service continuity. Also quality of supply, all those DER assets that we mentioned are a source of disturbances and the variable consumption patterns can lead to a poor power quality. Also, you know, it is very well known that the lack of visibility to those DER assets, utilities are not owning those assets. They don't have any direct control on those assets. 
Also, microgrids are really problematic. So reverse power flow from low voltage to medium voltage network. So as well as balancing the grid behind the transformer can cause a significant disruption on the grid. So there are quite many challenges that will need to be properly addressed by all the different stakeholders. Why digital transformation and cloud technologies are key to, let's say, to help in this energy transition journey? Well, it is obvious that the digital technologies are required to enable the observability and control of those new DER assets, PV panels, EV cars, uh, microgrids. As said before, this is a significant challenge when it comes to decarbonizing the power sector. We really think that uh, well, uh, there, is a, there is a need for a high degree of automation and analytics. All these types of things are needed to properly handle the growing volume of variable renewable generation. So a combination of power domain expertise with artificial intelligence and machine learning to deliver new predictive and prescriptive insights, as well as you know, in combination with uh, new IoT capabilities, all those things are critical to analyze the energy demand and control the grid in an efficient way. And here, cloud-enabled solutions will be key to orchestrate a complex network with complex underlying technologies. Because of that, we really believe that digital transformation and particularly cloud technologies are critical to achieve the goals of the European Green Deal. And it must be an immediate priority for utilities, vendors, and of course, regulators and policymakers, especially now that we are emerging from the COVID. So this is why Landis and Gear has partnered with Google Cloud to develop innovative solutions on the cloud which are aiming to overcome the energy transition challenges. I will stop here and Larry Cochran, my colleague from Google, will now introduce Google's point of view. So Larry, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Antonio. This is great. And thank you, Francis, uh, for the introduction. I'm excited to be here and, and speak on this very key topic near and dear to my heart. I wanna talk a bit about the um, deep partnership between Google and Landis and Gear and how cloud infrastructure and services can support this transition. Uh, our key vision is to enable energy providers and utilities to leverage operational data, bringing analytics and AI capabilities to make the right business decisions. And this will be especially important as we transition from a power system with 30 or 40 large thermal generating units to millions of distributed devices, distributed energy resources, and a um, large complement of wind and solar renewable energy in the energy mix and how to operate the power system in that environment. A couple of key, if we move to the next slide, a couple of key capabilities are going to be um, and the ability to work with um, unique data sets, bring advanced analytics, and um, bring innovation for how we operate the power system and how we make information available in the future. Google has a long history, and this is one of the areas that we believe we bring tremendous value to Landis and Gear and to operation of the power system. A few key examples, um, sunroof, this is visibility, um, not, not yet Antonio, this is visibility um, for uh, solar incidents. And this will be key in the distribution arena for understanding uh, the uh, distributed solar generation being injected at the distribution level and um, what portion of load that is offsetting. It's important to have experience with these large unique data sets. And there are some examples shown there. My key point is in the future, we will need to bring information from a wide variety of sources in order to drive the AI and ML. And um, the experience with the unique data sets will be very key to provide that um, information to inform these uh, 
um, operational processes. And then um, key in AI and ML is analytics to drive the um, new operation of the power system. It will move to a point where it will be very challenging for a human to um, be, be able to make the decisions for operation of the power system, which will require a significant level of automation. With that, we need to bring um, scale, we need to bring security, and we need to bring reliability of the infrastructure. And a few examples are shown here on how to approach that. If we move to the next slide, I want to talk briefly about the journey that we've been on and how this provides an example and will contribute to uh, carbon free energy and um, net zero by 2050. We've been on a journey for carbon free. We were carbon free in 2007. In 2017, we got to 100% renewable energy match. And this informed a lot around renewable energy and um, how to bring AI and ML for improving our efficiency. These same capabilities uh, we see in concert with the information provided by Landis and Gear and others for operation of the distribution grid to meet the challenges Antonio mentioned will be key. The other point I want to make here is the notion of 24 by 7 carbon free energy. Uh, most of the power purchase agreements that exist today are for what I would term naked renewables, a large block of 200 megawatts of wind energy. This is a great start, but what's actually delivered by the grid is whatever the energy mix is at the time. And we're interested in moving to uh, hour by hour, 20 by 24 by 7 carbon free energy. So when you think about the impact, that means units of power purchase agreement that are hourly time based. When you add the notion of time of uh, use pricing and the vast number of distributed assets, this becomes quite a complex problem and well suited for cloud analytics. But to be clear, this will be a mix of cloud and distributed processing at the edge. And that's where um, LN, LNG capabilities become very key. Moving to the next slide, just one example of how AI and ML bring uh, in intelligent um, capabilities to operations. Grid intelligence is one area that we use for internal trading. The thing that's relevant here is the notion of bringing weather forecasting, wind production forecasting, market intelligence and market price information, and AI ML to make recommendations for trading. This is composition of a number of different data sources that help to provide insight and bring the advanced analytics, AI and ML to a power system problem um, that significantly improves financial performance. We move to the next slide, uh, just one other example of how this cloud will help improve and move us toward um, um, carbon free energy and net zero is transparency about uh, energy usage. This particular example is with respect to energy usage for things running in um, Google data centers, but the same type of information is important and key for uh, any business. And this is an example of where you can take the information um, and the techniques used in cloud and apply those much more broadly in the industry. So Antonio, I wanna thank you and Francis. Gentlemen, thank you so much for these insightful keynotes. Um, I'm particularly intrigued by this kind of idea that, you know, uh, the things are out there, 
smart meters, solar panels on roofs, electric vehicle charging points, and it's the cloud that's going to enable us to bring them all together and uh, take things forward. So I think we should probably get things started with a quick tour de table and get some initial reactions from our panelists to the keynotes. Max, would you like to go first? Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Also, thank you very much for inviting us here from, from, the, from the European Commission. Yeah, I would like to pick two points uh, from, from your presentation. I largely agree to your vision on the energy transition that the two of you have presented. And, and maybe, maybe on the first one, I fully agree on the trend from the uni, unidirectional to bidirectional energy flow. And I think that's, that's key for also for our systems for the future. Fully loaded car batteries, for example, can help us shave energy consumption peaks in winter evening periods, for example, when light and household appliances create high demand. So I, I fully agree on that, but, but I would go one step further. I also agree to your trend from a centralized to a distributed energy grid. Now, where a bit of a new point comes in from my side is we believe that this should go hand in hand with a trend from purely central intelligence and data processing in the cloud to distributed intelligence and decision making at the edge and even on device level so it goes a bit further from the from the from the traditional cloud concept thank you brilliant lots to think about there including the smooth the edge mary you're the one with some actual customers and some actual power stations would you like to tell us your thoughts on the keynotes Thank you, Francis. Um, yes, Antonio and Larry have really shown us there the capability of cloud in dealing with these challenges, you know, the, the challenges of massive volumes of data and masses, massive need to process that data, uh, IoT and edge computing, and really the power of, of cloud from that perspective, but also AI and uh, the services that will be uh, that are available in cloud. Um, but it is it is the massive change and massive complexities that they described and the methods and mindsets of the past will not suffice here um, and we will not manage this effectively without a considerable change. That's my main thought in, 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 in this area. Fantastic. Thank you, Mary. So big change coming. It. I feel you guys are positioned very much at the forefront of that in a very innovative space. You want to tell us your thoughts? So yes, at Exayan, uh, which is a subsidiary of EGF Group, we are trying to do our best to reduce the carbon footprint of our cloud computing services. Actually, what we are trying to do is to give a second life to uh, some downgraded IT assets from the EGF Group. And by doing this, we are avoid, avoiding more than 50% of the carbon footprint linked to the, to the, the purchase of new um, IT assets. Actually, we are trying also to reuse the heat emitted from our machines in order to warm um, a pharmaceutical warehouses, which is just next to our uh, premises. We are also trying to put in place, actually, we have put in place a, a peak shaving mechanism, which is um, aimed at uh, 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 pushing some compute uh, from peak hours to off peak hours. Uh, we're also uh, trying to put in place now actually uh, some immersion cooling technologies in order to cool um, at a lower cost. When I'm trying I'm talking about costs, it's about the carbon footprint impact uh, or uh, activities within the data centers. Actually, something to remind uh, the electricity mix in Normandy, the region where we have our data centers uh, is uh, mainly construct from nuclear power and wind power, which means that our carbon footprint is less than 40 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, which is uh, quite low. And, uh, and in blockchain, because we are also very active in blockchain, we push forward all the proof of stake uh, consensus mechanism technologies. And at the end, uh, despite the, 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 the technology or the service that we are selling to our clients, we are providing them with a smart contract, guaranteeing them the carbon footprint of the services that we have sold to each of them. 
Oh, fantastic. And that's really interesting to hear about um, uh, carbon neutrality as a selling point. That's a, that's a whole step forward as well. So brilliant. Let me come to you, Carol. Uh, do you want to tell me about some of the work Accenture have been doing in this area? Thank you, Francis. Um, yes, from Accenture perspective, um, um, I'd like to make two comments uh, about acceleration and the systemic approach. I, I fully agree with what uh, has been said and thank you Antonio and Larry for the, the great perspective on energy management transition and the way uh, solutions, cloud-based solutions can support the transformation. Now, obviously, as you all know, uh, consumers, financial analysts are all expecting results in the decarbonization. And so the challenge now is moving from commitments to results. And I'll share with you uh, later on some uh, you know, results of a CEO study we've conducted at the beginning of November together with the United Nations uh, Global Compact to show that we still have a lot to do uh, to seize those opportunities for decarbonization and reach the actual results. The second comment is about the systemic approach. Yes, it's great to have cloud-based solutions and, and renewable um, uh, energies, uh, you know, uh, leveraging renewable energy, but it's not enough because electricity will be used a lot by many industries. So even if we have decarbonized electricity fueling our cloud infrastructure, we have to move also a bit to frugality in all our use of electricity. And that's also, you know, the, uh, on top of uh, the life cycle analysis and the fact that servers also during time of manufacturing need some energy that is for now not very much decarbonized. All of this means that, yes, we've done some progress on some aspects, but there is a need for this systematic perspective to make sure that we actually reduce the GHG emissions from end to end. Great, fantastic, Carol. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, this kind of holistic view that, uh, you know, the power is just the start of the story in many cases, and that's something we'll be coming back to later. Uh, before we plow into the, uh, before we plow into the, the full-on discussion, um, Larry, Antonio, is there anything you'd like to add, having heard the initial reaction from the panellists there? Antonio, do you Yes, thank you. So I think I would like to raise, you know, the point that Max, uh, you know, uh, was mentioning around, you know, combining its intelligence, you know, intelligence at the edge with uh, cloud analytics uh, and cloud-based, uh, you know, technologies. I think uh, I couldn't be more in agreement with that point, Max. So I think uh, clearly there is a need uh, to have a combination of both because uh, not everything can be done, you know, centralized on cloud analytics or cloud systems. So we need to have, you know, intelligence at the edge uh, and here while in, you know, within land and year, we are uh, a firm believer that uh, intelligence at the edge is a must. And we are, you know, uh, really investing a lot in that area. We are pretty convinced that uh, this is the, you know, the right uh, uh, path forward. Great. Thank you, Antonio. And Larry, anything else from your side at this point? Yes. Thank you very much, Francis. I agree very much with Antonio and Max around the hierarchy and of how solutions will need to, to evolve. I think there's a great deal that can be informed from the cloud based on availability of information, but I absolutely agree that um, we will need to operate at the edge for control of the power system for a number of key capabilities uh, and especially things that you don't want a round trip to the cloud for actual controls. I also believe very much with Mary around the size of this change. Uh, it's sometimes been likened to the most significant change since the war of the current, um, which was back at the very start of this industry. Um, we will be making very, very significant changes in terms of the amount of renewables, in terms of integration of distributed energy resources. And this will be a significant change to the operation of the power system, as well as um, operation of markets, for example. One simple example is electric vehicles. One electric vehicle on the grid um, doesn't make much impact at all. 
but imagine 10 electric vehicles uh, uh, connecting and fast charging simultaneously on the same feeder. This will trip virtually any feeder um, and will be a, a significant challenge for uh, distribution operators. And so capabilities for how you coordinate those resources will be key. And if you just think about the scale of this, this is very, very significant. And then I'd like to um, um, agree with Carol and kind of affirm the comment she made with respect to um, other areas and their energy use. It will be very important to be able to capture scope one and two, as well as scope three um, for energy use and impacts so that you can, first of all, purchase renewable energy on your move to um, net zero, but also if you can see it, then you can measure it, you can um, start to reduce it, you can manage it, and that will be really important for informed decision on all industries, not just the core of operation of the power system. Great. So we've heard a lot about the scale of the change that the industry is undergoing. But the big question is, why is all of this change happening? And the answer is really decarbonisation. So let's delve a little deeper into that. The cloud enables utilities to meet the demands of decarbonising power systems. As the penetration of distributed energy resources increases, utilities are going to have to rapidly build the capacity to bring in and monitor thousands of new behind the meter assets, such as batteries, rooftop solar systems and EV charging. This migration to the cloud can definitely unlock the scale, flexibility and agility that utilities need to effectively manage these assets and cause um, serious uh, calcium power savings in the process. But what are the lessons that can be learned from this industry? It's a moment to big yourself up, guys. So what valuable lessons can be learned from the integration of cloud-driven infrastructure and services in the power sector that can be transposed to other sectors, thus enabling European economies to achieve the objectives set by the Green Deal? So, you know, we've got everything from FATE keeping the temperature nice and regular at that pharmaceutical warehouse to kind of the uh, Carol's great point about frugality. This is a change for everyone. So uh, who'd like to go first? Carol, I think you've uh, already touched on this point. Sure, thank you, Francis. Um, so, you know, let me share a little bit to see where we stand in terms of uh, overall how the companies are embracing the decarbonization uh, journey. So um, in the third edition of the CEO study with uh, the United Nations Global Compact that we've published in beginning of, of November, we've asked more than uh, 1200 CEOs, where do you stand? And there are good news and less good news. So the good news is that there is a clear traction. And we've seen at the COP26 that the Race to Zero campaign has reached a new level. More and more CEOs are engaged. And, uh, you know, 7% of the uh, financial time stock exchange companies, for example, at COP26 have uh, committed on their net zero plan. So that's good news. All the good news is that between 2015 and 2019, SBTI companies collectively reduced their annual emissions by 25%. So th that's already a great achievement. Now, the less good news is that uh, the CEOs are telling us that only 2% have validated their targets with the science-based targets initiative uh, to make sure that their targets are in line with the climate, what the climate science is telling us as sufficient to limit the, the climate change below 105 degrees by 2100. 20, uh, and 5% only of the CEOs say they are on track compared to their own targets. And to Larry's points about scope one, scope two, and scope three, a lot of CEOs are really struggling to manage scope three GAG emissions because they have very limited EAG data across the value chain. Uh, so obviously this is progressing, uh, but we can see that 
um, you know, not only the cloud infrastructure will help because if you are a bank, a professional services, then part of your GLG emission is very much linked to your IT systems. But of course, it will not be enough. And data will be a game changer, as you know, uh, Larry uh, outlined. And here, cloud based solutions, in particular, SaaS solutions to do the ESG data management, uh, will be key. Only 25% of companies say that they have advanced level to simply be able to report on their carbon footprint and do even more reporting, do the performance management of it. Uh, and then uh, beyond ESG data performance management, obviously for the industry, digital twin uh, and other AI capabilities, IoT that has already been mentioned, all this needs to uh, you know, be put in motion and, and uh, be, be uh, accelerated. Uh, one last comment. So we've, uh, together with uh, 26 ICT CEOs, Accenture has signed uh, the European Green Digital Coalition. In 2022, this coalition will publish some recommendations on how, by for each sector, what uh, methods and tools can be applied to do the green digital transformation and to understand the net value of, uh, of cloud-based solutions. This is signed by Microsoft, by SAP, by Schneider Electric, by Dassault Systems, by you know, many, many companies, and I hope it will you know, uh, be useful for many sectors. Back to you, Francis. Fantastic, thanks, Carol. And it's interesting to hear about these things going on kind of across industries and sectors. Um, we touched a bit on the Internet of Things as well. So, Max, perhaps I could bring you in here and you can talk a bit about how that can support the twin green and digital transitions of the energy systems because there's several changes at once. Yeah, thank you very much. Let me, let me before I start with that, let me give a bit of a policy perspective here. When we look at achieving the ambitious target, targets of the, of the policies, the European Green Deal and European Fit for the Digital Age, or in other words, I could say the twin transition and the digital, the twin transition green and digital. This will be effective only if we coordinate, and that goes into the direction of, of Carol, if we coordinate well, uh, will be effective if we coordinate well across the different policies. So that means linking digital to energy to mobility, to living and buildings. And, and one of you gave a good example. It's a difference whether you have one electric car or whether you have a hundred or thousands and it has an impact on the electricity grid. So a very strong link to mobility, same kind of link uh, to living. So it's, it's very important to get out of silos and to look across. Digital technologies are at the core of that for this optimization and digital technologies and IoT in particular can help us become more sustainable as enablers for optimizing energy and resource consumption. So digital as a means for monitoring and minimizing environmental impacts and also for mitigating, for example, extreme weather conditions. But we must be careful because more and more and more digital, we must pay attention, however, to tracking and minimizing the negative impacts of ICT. One of you has mentioned the impact of the data centers and, and the huge energy cost. And, and, and I would extend that even to the fast growing IoT. This includes risks of cyber attacks, energy consumption, use of critical raw materials as was in the press a lot this week, CO2 emissions and waste, or even negative social impacts, not that much in the core of this, this panel. So I would say while currently most data is processed in the cloud, in the data centers, the discuss decentralization trends will raise the importance of computing more where the data is located in order to reduce also the data that's sent around that sent around the network. And I come back to my point on IoT and edge computing can reduce latency bandwidth consumption and improve security. So the, the transition to more decentralized computing can also help reduce the environmental impact and contribute to decarbonization by processing data closer to where it's produced and limiting or reducing the use of networks and data centers. So by allowing companies to analyze data already at the edge, 
or an IT device level before sending it to, to the cloud can really help also to support privacy and confidentiality. For example, in health, not in, ener in energy as well, but the best example is always for that is the, the tool at the body that, that assesses the health status of a person directly without sending and thereby not sending all the data. So in, in general, I would support also Carol on her point on the systematic, systemic approach. And we need a systemic approach across the energy system, some of the uh, users of the energy and also the cloud edge to IoT compute continuum that we in a way want to create. So I, I put another systemic kind of view in this debate. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Max. It's really interesting because when I first heard about edge processing, it was always in terms of GDPR. And yeah, you know, I'm learning so much today about how much it can mean in terms of energy efficiency. And Fatih, let me come to you in the meantime and ask where you fit into all of this because um i guess you know, decarbonization you're in a kind of unique position uh part of edf kind of giant name that rolls off the tongue but you're also very much on the cutting edge of innovation with the actual services you provide so do you want to tell us a bit about how you see things playing out in the real world actually at EGF group and at exayan we are investing a lot you know on all this um, digitalization of uh, of uh, the energy sector in uh, many different parts in the energy production by using some uh, um, uh, nuclear power plant uh, digital twins in the grid uh, electricity grid transportation and distribution by using uh, the smart uh, the smart grids technologies and smart metering uh, technologies and also using iot on um, on, uh, on 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 the grid levels on the high voltage, mid voltage, and low voltage um, electricity grids, and at uh, the very um, uh, bottom, close to the client, we are also deploying a lot of uh, different technologies. Uh, some are based on the, for instance, um, blockchain, where we are guaranteeing the final clients that the energy that they have bought are coming from. Uh, X percent nuclear, Y percent uh, uh, renewables, and uh, and so, and so on. Then we are in uh, in every stage and in each uh, part of the value chain from energy production down to uh, the the consumer. Great. So there's a whole uh, aspect there of uh, I love this idea of provenance of the energy and working out exactly where it has come from to do just how decarbonized it is. Before we move on to talking about digitalization, uh, might be time for a quick word about the regulatory landscape. We've talked a lot about the green cloud. Um, do you think there's any big regulatory changes that need to happen? Would anybody like to, to come in on that? Do I see any hands going up? Or is it something that we'll cover in the fullness of the next question? Because it does tie in quite neatly digitalization. Yeah, go on, let's forge ahead and uh, bring that one in later. So with the upcoming publication of the EU Action Plan on the digitalization of the energy sector, the Commission is trying to promote further synergies between the ICT and the energy sector. In light of this, perhaps we could talk about the hurdles that people have experienced. What have been the most significant hurdles and regulatory gaps to furthering the development and deployment of cloud-based solutions? what should the action plan include to address these maybe larry i could come to you on this one from google's perspective well i can certainly comment on um, what we need from the operation of the power system perspective and that will be um, the ability to coordinate these resources and a um, climate or environment that helps to inform how to approach that and so I think it will be key, um, whether it's purchase of flexibility or direct control of flexibility in the case of vertically integrated utilities, um, bringing this will be uh, very important for uh, operation of the power system. Um, so I, I think that that will be key. And um, I, I do think that information will enable informed decisions whether that's on the part of consumers or on the part of asset providers such as 
um, EV charging stations or um, community storage, these things for strengthening the uh, strengthening the power system, and then um, the ability to enable many different approaches, whether that be non-wire solutions or further strengthening of the uh, of the power grid, and what's the best approach to go forward. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Larry. And Satya, this is uh, really your bread and butter, so perhaps you could tell us a bit more about uh, your work in this area. Yeah, in terms of regulation, uh, I have two remarks to, 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 to make here. Uh, and actually, I have two statistics. The first one is coming from ADEM, which is a French agency, uh, which says that by 2030, 13% of the world electricity uh, consumption will come from the cloud, actually. And by 2050, it will be 100% of the actual electricity production. Then if nothing is done in the way of managing our data and collecting the data, uh, filtering, managing, and providing some services out of this data, uh, I mean, uh, modernization and digitization of the economy, and when I'm talking about economy, it's also about energy, uh, it will it might cause more hurdles than uh, solving solution for companies and for uh, and for people and actually we have also another uh, issue about all that is that we really need to put some uh, regulation in place in order to push the cloud service providers in order to 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 try to reduce their consumption but also to clean the the way of uh, feeding their uh, data centers. And this is something on which we are very uh, uh, focused on at, um, at EGF Group. So it's a question of getting your own house in order to, and I know that Larry's been, and Google have been very active in the way they uh, have innovative cooling systems for their data centers, everything from putting them up in Finland to uh, the next lots of wind. So Mary, let me come to you now and broaden it out. What, along with cloud-based solutions, do you see as being necessary to drive the digitization of the energy sector? Well, Francis, um, there is a lot. Um, and as I was saying earlier, this is very significant change. But uh, utilities really need to take a proactive approach here. And I believe we certainly are, or, or at least we are at ESP. Um, cloud offers an awful lot. And, um, you know, it's an obvious capability that is necessary here. But so are a lot of other things, customer centricity and the skills and the ability to design your solutions in, in that way and to implement in that way. But also uh, employee uh, centricity and employee experience um, obviously those massive volumes of data and the need to manage that data carefully um, that requires a very clear data strategy and again, the ability to manage and uh, run your systems effectively to manage your data according to that strategy. Cybersecurity, obviously, for everyone today, you know, it requires such a focus, and that focus has to start at, at design. So, um, a very strong cyber secure by design ethos, and then following that ethos. Again, a cloud offers an awful lot there, um, but you need that cyber secure by design ethos and that philosophy is such. Um, utilities also need a digital operating model and, and a digital delivery mechanism or delivery capability. And that's a relatively new and one that we're growing. Um, long experience and expertise in IT, but now we need to really build a strong digital capability. Um, none of that will happen without the right talent. And talent is such a challenge at the moment and with the with the war on talent, particularly in the cyberspace and the digital space and data and analytics, etc. And I think after all that, then there's one crucial element, and that's to recognize this as a very considerable change program and um, to have a very strong culture and change approach to it in order to bring your people with you um and drive drive it out like that and at a forum like today I, I couldn't leave out the ecosystem in that we're all going to have to do this together so for utilities to have a very strong ecosystem and to be able to work with their partners and rely on their partners in in moving this on and in progressing it none of us are going to do this on our own 
and we really need to collaborate very closely together and work in, in really strong partnership like never before. Great, Mary, thank you so much. Um, that's all fascinating stuff. Uh, now, when it comes to the EU action plan, I know that Max, this isn't your DG that is behind it, but you are also in the Commission and I just wondered if you had some views that you'd like to share with us. Yes, indeed. I mean, maybe that's not news, maybe you know it already, but I would like to turn the discussion a bit into some action for you. So let's be a bit operational here as well. With, with the communication on EU strategy for inner system integration, the, the Commission proposed the, the adoption of a system-wide digitalization of energy action plan. So that's the status. We proposed this. And this plan which will support both Europe's digital decade as well as the Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package is an important tool for us in setting up concrete steps for achieving this green transition. So what I would like to ask you is to send us your comments because we have launched a consultation which will close on the 24th of January. So what I've heard now from Larry and from others around the table and Mary, I think that's also quite important for us. But it shouldn't come from me, it should come from you because, because we are consulting you. And, and just to tell you the five areas that we are consulting on in for this action plan, which we indeed envisage to publish uh, sometime during the in the course of the next year so point one is the dev developing a european data sharing infrastructure for new energy service so data sharing data spaces second is empowering the citizen and ensuring that consumers benefit from digitalization of energy through better services and i would also bring in the word here that larry mentioned pro consumers yeah so so we go a bit from to, away from the traditional consumer concept the third point is enhancing the uptake of digital technologies in the energy sector but that's not for the sake of using digital but that's looking at what we want to achieve and how can digital help we sometimes you know we are sometimes very technically oriented and, and phrase it a bit from the techie side yeah but but we, we really mean where can it help obviously Mary has mentioned it, ensuring cyber security is a key issue. And also we would like to look at the footprint of, of, of ICT, so climate neutrality of, of, of ICT. So for this public consultation running until 24th of January, we really invite you to respond and tell us your views. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Lemke. Sorry. And uh, Sorry, you just one... very much in public consultation mode. Uh, I'd like to urge you all to also be in public consultation mode and keep using today's hashtags, uh, Digitopia and Electric Decade, to share your thoughts. Max, perhaps I could keep you on the line and now we could turn to uh, what is your direct responsibility in your job, the energy data space. Um, so do you want to talk about your plans in that area and when it comes to cloud infrastructure as well? Because it kind of brings together. Yeah, I could give you a bit of a, a little overview on where we are. I mean, all of what I tell now is, is more or less public knowledge, but you find it in different pieces of communication. So I try to pull it a bit together. So when we look at the policy, with its data strategy, the, the European Union announced in 2020 the development of common European data spaces in nine domains, verticals, and sectors of strategic importance for Europe, including health, mobility, energy, agriculture, nine of them. But energy is among them and the, the important ones like smart cities and also the important one of, LN, of mobility, which are closely linked are among them. Data sharing in the energy sector, I would say is key to achieve the green deal. A flexible and integrated energy system requires easy and seamless data sharing to enable demand response of heating through heat pumps or smart charging of electric cars. Something we, we have discussed before, the electric cars, how important they are. It's also important for renovation of buildings, making, making future building energy efficient or renovate current buildings, making them energy efficient. And we should bear in mind that heating in buildings is responsible for, let's say, around 40 percent of the EU's energy consumption. So 40 percent, that's quite a high number. So the European Union aims to support 
notably through the Digital Europe program, that's one of the key programs here, the deployment of the above mentioned common European data spaces. So we bring together the relevant existing and emerging data infrastructures and derive the governance mechanisms to facilitate data sharing in strategic sectors. So a data space for us is infrastructure and governance and EU funding. We know we don't put that much funding. We, we don't put billions or many billions of euros at that. So what European funding for is really building the glue between the, the current and emerging data infrastructure. So European role, typical European role, also from, from the contract, from the treaty, is that we build the glue across what is, what, what is existing. And we have a particular aim here. This is where Europe is relatively weak. We look at really, a, we look at really voluntary data sharing by actors, including also industrial and business actors, respecting ownership of data. So I think that's that's the concept. So under the now a bit on on the operational side on the first work program of Digital Europe, which has published was published last week, by the way, we support the deployment of common European data spaces in verticals. And here we we focus on health, mobility, manufacturing, agriculture, but not yet on energy. Yeah, we, we aim at supporting the deployment of the energy data space in the next work program in 2020 three of the work of, of, of digital Europe. But at the same time, we are now already, and the first call on that close already, in the research and innovation program, Horizon Europe, we prepare the ground. The EU is supporting through this program the exploration of different solutions for setting up and running a common European data space for energy. And we will clearly, when we develop that further in 23, we will also look at the link to other sectors like the mobility sector, like the build, building and construction sector. And uh, you have mentioned as well the cloud. So as a second and strong, uh, a second part of the data strategy, the Commission will invest in European, fed, in a European federated cloud edge continuum. So you hear the word federated. So it's will be distributed and we would we look in particular at the characteristics that are key in Europe high data protection safety security energy efficiency and also portability and standards yeah so it will include the offering of a decentralized of decentralized data, data processing closer to the user as i've said at the edge and in the long term also at device level and we will invest about 2 billion euros starting into starting this year as part of several programs uh, across the European programs, namely Digital Europe, the Connecting Europe facility, number two, it's the second one of these, Horizon Europe, and also the next generation EU programs that come out of the recovery and resilience package together with the member states. So for those of you who are, who are more interested, in details, please note that the first work program of Digital Europe, as I've said, was or was published last week, and you may want to look into it. It includes key it includes key actions on the development of data spaces as well as cloud to edge infrastructures. So that gives you a bit of the overview where where we are heading and what is in the pipe for the European innovation programs. In parallel, we are driving forward the legislation, but that's beyond the scope of uh, this meeting, I would say. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Max. So much to think about there. So I like how you were talking about the energy data space as a kind of glue that is going to join everything together, because I feel uh, in today's panelists, we've got all the bits that are about to get stuck. So, uh, Antonio, perhaps I could come to you for a bit of reaction, because you have so many of the, the pieces that are about to be glued together. Um, would you like to? Well, thank you, Francis. So I think it's important, you know, to highlight, uh, you know, my point of view is that, uh, you know, right now there are few biggest barriers uh, in the cloud adoption mm -hmm, when it comes to the energy sector. And those barriers are mainly, you know, security mm -hmm, and privacy. It was really very good to hear from Max right now that uh, 
you know, the EU is investing a lot uh, in those areas uh, and how we are going to create those, you know, data sharing spaces, you know, in a way that uh, we can start working, you know, with cloud to edge, you know, technologies as well. Mm -hmm. And trying to, let's say, from the regulation point of view, trying to put something in place that can be, let's say, in some way, solving the problems uh, that, uh, solving those concerns that most of the utilities are having in terms of data privacy. So it is really necessary to have, you know, a good regulation in that regards. Also cybersecurity, Mary was uh, uh, touching that point. So security is one of the biggest concerns right now, you know, for most of the utilities, again, when adopting the cloud. All those things need to be, you know, evolving during the coming years. Uh, there are quite many significant advances, you know, during the last years. But now there are quite many modern landing zones, you know, with new mechanisms in terms of cybersecurity, networking, protecting the data, you know, very well. But requirements are changing continuously. It's a very dynamic space. Mm -hmm. And it's really very important, very, very important that regulation will follow those changing requirements and those dynamics. So I really encourage, you know, the European Commission in that regard, because, you know, I think uh, uh, it is extremely important for the coming years to be very dynamic in pushing forward in that direction, trying to get the regulation following the industry trends. Thank you, Frances, back to you. Brilliant. Okay, so that's interesting, kind of throwing things forward in terms of regulation. Uh, Carol, you've worked with a lot of clients in this uh, area uh, on their kind of energy transition. And now that you know, this next big stage of change is coming, uh, what do you think needs to happen? Um, I think it's time for companies and uh, to, to, to uh, be able to build trust on the actual results they achieve uh, in terms of decarbonization and uh, energy transition. And that goes very much, that is very much linked to the information and the reports that uh, we're able to give to the tools, to the end consumers to make their own choices on what is you know, uh, less impactful or more impactful. And so what Max has said as you know, building the, those data spaces and uh, data sharing, uh, being able for companies to uh, leverage those trust, uh, I mean, trustworthy data uh, that is the basis for, you know, company ESG reports and in the end, uh, uh, consumers uh, information. That is, that is, I think, really key. Um, it's also what, what I can see as uh, also very useful for the companies is what, hap what has been announced in the COP26 is the harmonization of uh, the various ESG standards. There are so many of them. So, uh, and that creates also confusion. Um, and so the, the, the announcement uh, that the International Sustainable Standards Board will work on such harmonization, and I guess EU will, will have a key role in this, will also help, you know, bringing that trust uh, for companies and in the end for the, the end consumers. Carol, thank you so much. Uh, Larry, can I have your thoughts on uh, energy data space? Sure, absolutely. Of course, this is a um, key area for Google and absolutely fundamental to our business. Um, I, I think this is an area where we certainly can help with the um, notion of data spaces. Of course, data sovereignty, regional sovereignty, um, operational sovereignty, and how you protect information uh, or make information available at scale is certainly something that Google works on each and every day. I think the environment, um, as was pointed out both by Max and Antonio for uh, cybersecurity, will continue to be very key. And this is an area that continues to evolve as the nature of threats and um, cybersecurity evolves. And that's where alignment with a um, hypercloud provider, I think will be very key for helping to bring information protection while still making it broadly available. So supporting those that, that build the data spaces and make that data um, available and in an environment 
that speaks to ESG, I, I think will be very, very key. Um, um, back to um, some of the uh, comments that Faith made around um, data centers that uh, dynamically migrate loads and um, move between regions for additional efficiency and align with carbon, I think will be very key for uh, removing um, the carbon footprint associated with computation that runs in data centers. And that's certainly something that we can do for uh, our own core business, but then also providing the foundation to be able to make um, these data spaces uh, available at, at scale. Great. Larry, thank you so much. Uh, Mary, uh, perhaps I could come to you now, your sort of, uh, concluding thoughts possibly even on the uh, energy data space and what it's like to be a player there. Well, um, obviously huge challenges ahead and, um, you know, even appreciating data and seeing data as an asset is, is a change for the utility sector. Um, and you know we're we're going to have to approach this, as I say, uh, with new methods and new mindsets. Um, but I don't think we should uh, look at it all, you know, in a pessimistic way. In that I think there are significant synergies here, and it probably in a broader sense than just data. Um, I think one way of thinking about decarbonisation is thinking of it as the need to um, converge IT and OT in an accelerated way. Um, and converging IT and OT is also like uh, thinking about uh, converging the engineering, energy engineering and utility engineering world with that of the IT and digital world. And then if you think of the utility sector, um, and our, uh, let's say, experience and expertise lies in the whole engineering area and um, also a long history of, of IT experience and expertise and now a growing capability in digital. So if you think of that combination, then it's actually a very powerful combination in facing this challenge um, if it can be optimised. And I suppose in optimising it, I think we need to focus on upskilling but also on, on, on a growth mindset and, and always learning and always being open to learning, which is a very different mindset than the mindset that the utility sector was always relied upon, which was very much always having the answer and um, always being reliable and available, etc. So there's you know, a significant shift there for us. I go back to that point again about the right talent. Uh, that's imperative here. And it is so difficult now in, in competing with every other sector. And one way of thinking about this is what is the order of prioritization for decarbonization? Where should we put our talent? And definitely, I feel the utility sector needs to be right up there in terms of the right talent um, to meet the challenges of decarbonization. And then again, I go back to that. Um, that point about the e ecosystem and partnership and collaboration because that is a route through for utilities to get at the right talent and to get at the skill transfer that's required here so a very strong ecosystem um is also key here so yes it's broader than data but it is that strong combination of engineering and digital and then optimizing that combination um, and I would see that as an area of opportunity and synergy um, that we, we really do need to optimise. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Mary. So I guess if I can come to you, Lars Wolfatir, thank you for being so patient. Um, I guess if you want to touch on Mary's point about talent, um, I'd love to know how you find hiring people, given that seems to be a big part of the equation, and then your thoughts on the energy data space more generally. Yes, actually, regarding the energy data space, uh, there is uh, one point on which we are very uh, focused also at Exion. It's uh, first, you know, the, the security of all the data which are stored and shared uh, uh, among the different players. But it's also uh, the dimension of um, the sovereignty dimension of the data, which is very important here is that all the data uh, stays within the European borders and that there is no that it will be no breach regarding all these uh, all these datas. 
this is also a dimension uh, that we haven't talked here, but uh, which I think is uh, is very important as much as uh, the cybersecurity or the carbon footprint of the cloud industry. Great. And in terms of finding talent uh, recruitment, whether you would speak briefly to that. So I haven't understood. Oh, so uh, Mary was speaking about how hard it is to get the right people. But basically, there's a big, you know, if you're a great programmer, you can work for a bank, you can work for a telco, you can work for a startup. How, uh, yeah, how's your industry going to? Actually, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very tough uh, situation. I mean, in France, in Europe, and I think uh, everywhere, we are lacking, you know, um, uh, IT guys, develop, uh, developers, uh, telecom uh, experts, specialists, and actually uh, this is a very difficult situation. Uh, we are trying, for instance, at Exion to hire uh, more than 50 uh, people this year uh, on very specific areas, telco, cybersecurity, blockchain, um, Kubernetes, OpenStack, and so on and so on. And it's quite, quite difficult. And there is a huge scarcity and I hear the same uh, problematic on the other side of uh, the marsh in the UK. And I have also a lot of friends in the US uh, telling me the same thing. And also on top of the scarcity of the experts, there is also the volatility of the experts, which has quite increased since um, uh, this uh, COVID-19 crisis. We can see also um, a huge move and a huge volatility among uh, um, teams uh that we haven't seen before great all right thank you so much for that it's just interesting because i suppose it's yet another part of the european commission uh but you know the digital skills gap whenever we talk about these questions it always seems to come up and it's always something that people are working towards so i don't know whether there's any young engineers tuning in today but you have uh, made some wise decisions in your studies right i think we're out of time so i want to say thank you to all of our panelists it's been absolutely fascinating i've learned a lot I hope you have too. I guess I have to sum it up. As a moderator, you can't beat three things. I'm going to have three Ps today. Planet, people, and power. So planet, why are we doing all this? Decarbonisation goals, more, more ambitious than ever. And uh, the cloud is going to be crucial in getting us there. Uh, people, not only the search for talent, but also the rise of the prosumer, the fact that people who were once just taking power out of the grid can now put it in. On a personal note, a little shout out to my father-in-law, who is absolutely obsessed with electric vehicle charging points. If, if he wants to see his grandchildren, it's got to be in a place where he can charge his car because, man, he loves charging that gear. And then uh, on a third point, I would say it all comes down to power because that's uh, what's driving us revolution that's what's driving this change so huge thank you to all of the panelists to you guys for tuning in don't let the conversation stop here please use the hashtags digitopia and electrical decade electric decade to share your thoughts further and i'd like to pass the floor to Rémi garoud verdier who's head of european affairs at nadis who'll be your moderator for today's second panel on cyber security and system resilience in the power sector all right thank you all so much brilliant bye Good afternoon. I'm Rémi Garot Berdier, head of European Affairs within Enedis. Enedis is the main French electricity DSO. We are operating the grid of 95% of the French territories, and we are also serving a bit more than 37 million customers. I'm glad and delighted to moderate today's discussion because cybersecurity is a major topic for Enedis as we support the highest level of cybersecurity possible. But let's back up one step uh, to remember an energy system that used to be non-digitalized and much centralized. From a DSO perspective, at this time, the main challenge was to efficiently manage the grid and ensure its physical resilience. But now, with the digital revolution, the energy sector is highly connected to other. Digital hub of all with the uptake of smart reads, smart meters, new flows of data, 
but also the transport sector with more and more EVs and EVs chargers, all connected to the grid. Also, the buildings are connected to the grid. So physical resilience is still a major concern for electricity DSOs, especially in the context of uh, global warming on, and growing unpredicted climate uh, hazards. So for these aspects, we have a long-standing experience, all the DSOs, not only energies, but it, it has to be coupled with cyber security resilience to also ensure the availability of the networks. This aspect is quite new for us, and we had to rapidly. Today, for this uh, topic, we have an impressive panelists. First, and sorry if I uh, mispronounce uh, your name, Ole Tom Zerstad uh, from Microsoft. We also have Felipe Castro, cybersecurity policy officer at the DG Energy, at the European Commission. Justin Love, cybersecurity lead for the energy utility sector at PA Consulting. And Ton Tingbo, VP cybersecurity at uh, Statkraft. Statkraft is a leading company in Europe in renewable generation. That's impressive speakers. And if you are following us or if you are using the social media, don't forget to use the hashtag Digitopia and the hashtag Electric Decade to mention this, uh, this uh, meeting within, on the, the social media. First speaker today is uh, Ole Tom from, uh, from Microsoft. Thank you for being with us, Ole, and uh, the floor is yours. Merci, Remy. Uh, close to pronounce my name right, but it's close enough. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak at this event um, during uh, this actually pretty exciting times. Cybersecurity is something we look at all the time uh, from Microsoft point of view and most of the industry as well. And we see some it's a lot of actors that are trying to, to disrupt different kinds of what internet and internet services is delivering. It's going to uh, government attacks, it's going to, to uh, healthcare, and we also see that uh, the grid and the electricity is a target for a lot of criminals and, uh, and actors that try to disrupt it. And we have to remember one thing, electricity, it's not that old, but still the entire society is very dependent on it. The society today will have huge trouble if the electricity system is taken down, take down. Nothing will work. We don't get any communication like internet, we could leave it out. But internet is depending on electricity, the water supply is depending, the transport that you mentioned, is deploying on electricity and information flow. So it's very important to protect this asset as a part of critical infrastructure going forward. And we have invested. Most of the companies have invested in some security solution. We build firewalls. We build um, monitoring system. We build system to watch our uh, systems to protect us. But the security landscape is changing and it's changing rapidly. We have challenges that we don't even think about just a couple of years ago, and it's still changing all the time. And we have to remember the criminal don't follow any laws, don't follow any procedures. They just go after our information. So current defense is not longer sufficient to protect with a changing environment. We're talking about a lot of data a huge amount of data. You mentioned some of it. You mentioned uh, industries and, and uh, EVs, etc. A car is always sending data back to, electric car is always sending data back to their service and we're using a lot of AI to analyze it and how to find the signal in that noise. And, and other areas, we don't have enough knowledge. We don't know actually what's going on. And these challenges need to be solved somehow. 
This is a picture from building of Tokke hydropower plant owned by Tuna and Statcraft today. This, my grandfather is in the uh, picture there. He was one of the managers building this plant. It's open in 1961. Do you think these people think about IoT, cybersecurity, and, and how these sensors and how these solutions actually should be one day connected to the grid or the internet and have a global market, at least a European market, to, to deliver the, what they were building? I don't think so. And I know my grandfather didn't think so either because he hated computers. He was figuring out how to build the, the power, power station, the power plants. So this is one of the challenges because what was built back in the 60s? This is hydropower from Norway. I'm sure the rest of Europe has hydropower. They have nuclear reactors built on the same time frame. They have coal and other technologies that was built during the last 60, 70, 80 years. And today, most of them are connected in some hall. And we also see that the cyber criminal have a lot of resources to get information from. We see this is a threat to national security. And as I mentioned, we can't survive long without electricity in today's society. And they are going after all sectors, including your, your vendors, even if they don't try to, to hack or take control over uh, the plant itself, they can come in through, through your um, value chain, your supply chain, and they continue to mature. One thing we see that are positive trends is transparency. We see people sharing. We see it's established sector CERT, CERT is the computer emergency response teams cooperating. And we also see that it's a way new laws, task forces, resources, and partnership. Partnership uh, that was unthinkable just years ago. And as you can see on this slide, you can buy. You can buy your your uh, ransomware kit, for instance, $66 and upwards. You can buy compromised PC and devices. You can buy stolen passwords. So everyone can be a cyber criminal for low amount of money. So what we're thinking about is these three, protect, detect, and respond. This is Microsoft's uh, um, way of doing it. And one important thing is monitoring and control know what's going on on your solution. The next, I think, is the most important, identity and access management. Who has access to your data? How is that data secured? And we know after first host is compromised, and the first host can be a PC, a mobile phone, an IoT device, a sensor, a control mechanism in, in the system, it's less than two days before the bad guys have access to your network. So detect is extremely important to have this overview, what's going on in your environment. And of course, you need a plan and tools and process to respond when you see something's going on. To closing the gap between the first host compromised until you are back in normal business and getting rid of this. So what we could help you with is to share which we're doing, and we implement that in our product, the AI engine Microsoft is, is using, um, including signals from IoT devices and your environment. So just this as an example, we get trillion of signals, both from uh, sensors. We scan, for instance, 470 billion emails from malware per month. That's about 180,000 per second. And we also remove malware before it hits you. And we see that this needs to be expanded into IoT and IoT devices. Because device interact with both the physically and the cyber more and more. This is some of the people again building the Toki power plant in Norway. And this had no plans to, to connect this to other things than the grid, but still it's now connected. So addressing security issue by bolting solution 
into widely deployed system is not a viable thing. We need to have sensors that not only sensors that control the, the different kind of electricity, the grid, the plants, etc., but also sensors that looking for abnormalities in the system. What if kind of analyst using the built-in AI engine to, to actually see what's going on in your uh, environment? And we need people, we need people to understand that at the same way. And that's a challenge for both the entire industry, the entire world. Today, it estimated is a lack of 3.5 million security experts globally. We need to broaden the education to actually address these things. And one of the challenge is the IoT devices, because it's a lot of them are built for years. And we see a growth in attacks. We put up some honeypots uh, for you don't, don't know what that is. We pretend to be an IoT. Uh, hub and see what kind of attacks going through that honeypot. And we see a dramatically growth in, in people trying to get control over IoT devices. We also expect that to grow to 50 billion units by 2025. So it's a massive scale on, on attack to the, to the IoT device. And the challenge in this area is the different uh, approach the operation had on the IT security, your administrative works, etc., and the operation technology security. There is huge difference between prioritizing what to look after. Because IT security looking on confidentiality, privacy, etc., while the operation technology is looking to safety and also availability. Standard protocols and devices compared to special protocols, devices, legacy software, legacy operating system. Maybe the, the vendor of, of some of the OT device is out of business, but you still have to run it. High level of connectivity and traditionally air gapped on OT security, that's changing. We're putting these OT devices and environment into the traditional internet connections which is also um, a challenge. And also multiple layers of controls and telemetry and very little insight into the risk at IoT devices. So the costs are, of course, several, depending on what, what you're doing. Um, device bricked or held for ransom. You can see you get the same ransomware, ransom, that you, you have read about in the press late, lately years. Uh, and you can also use the device for malicious purpose. Data and IP theft, of course, and also polluted data and compromise and device attack. And this is some of the results we have from our findings. We see that 71% has old versions of Windows running on this system. system without patching. I mean, know for sure most of the attacks go through unpatched systems. Or the next one, an encrypted password or no password at all. And they are not running any update for AV definitions and not have the possibility to enable uh, visibility into their system. This is huge numbers and we need to address them. So CyberX risk report uh, shows some of these findings uh, in the net itself. So key takeaways for this, it's no silver bullets that will eliminate all security risk. And from our point of view, you should have the assume breach thinking. Everything you should doing is to assume there is a breach. So attackers are always trying to get into your system. And if you have an assumed breach, you protect your system in several layers. You're creating like a mountain tops they need to go over. Because you can check that, you can check the identity, you can check what kind of application is coming in as, as 
some or some have no uh, internal uh, systems that said uh, you're not allowed to install some software or other is doing it so any any application any user any data accessed should be checked and then also we know that after first host is compromised if it's a pc or an iot device the criminals has less than two days before they have admin access of your solution so reducing the surface area for privileged access users is extremely important and also use multi-factor authentication etc and a pragmatic security strategy and then again stay up to date we are used to stay up to date on our say white collar uh, environment the office people the people looking into the traditional pc industry but we also need to stay up to date as much as possible on the iot as these systems are connected so let's keep the light on by securing securing a plan securing the grid securing the information system securing the even to the to the measurement in people's home from from where the energy is produced distributed and uh, to every single user's home so thank you that's what for me Thank you Ole, for this very interesting presentation. It shows nobody's safe from uh, cyber attacks and that Microsoft is providing several tools to its customers, of course, to, to protect, to detect, and to respond to cyber attack. I also understand that reaching a zero cyber risk is utopia, but transparency, cooperation, are key to protect uh, ourselves and if i may ask you a question from your perspective what is the main risk for the power sector yeah uh, thanks uh, i think one of the, the the challenges for for the the electricity industry is the legacy it's an old industry uh, based on some old technology and and also based on isolation and as more and more of this going to be integrated into other systems you have an you have the north pole for instance with with sale and um, and uh, distribution of of, of uh, power and prices uh, you can manipulate that or you have the the legacy systems that actually is connected to internet without uh, internet ready protection mechanisms in place and all this together so it's it's depending on greenfield brownfield uh, solutions for instance greenfield solution modern solutions they build today operated today are, are are safer but the brownfield the old software old uh, old stuff right? <laughs> they put it that way is a challenge because there's not designed for it they're not they have not the software needed they have not the the, the, the sensors to, to actually see if they are compromised or not and of course that's an cheap and easy way into the system thank you for uh, your answer may i ask the other panelists for a first reaction on uh, what has been uh, has been said by uh, ole from microsoft could be felipe for i mean yeah, thank you ole for for the first comments so indeed i i i think as well that one of the main issues no, in this sector is, is this uh, legacy. I would say is this, this mix eh, of, of legacy and new technologies, which makes uh, difficult already because of the lack of homogeneity first, no, but, but especially because it's true that it's a sector where many of those uh, digital devices, they, they are installed for a long time and, 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 and they, they need uh, to be protected in a, in a way that is not the standard way that you do it in, in, in IT. Uh, environments that are maybe more uh, modern and that have the capability to to, to follow processes for, for updates that are, are now mature. No? So I, I, indeed, this is for me one of the elements we always say now in the sector, especially in electricity, but that is, is this combination of, of legacy and makes the real time uh, aspect of, of electricity, uh, which is not the same in, in other energy sectors, not maybe in gas and oil, but it's still it's, it's, it's also there. No? Yeah, so yes, I would agree on that one. Thank you, Felipe, for your reaction. 
Tony, it seems that you would like to, to add something on uh, what was said just before. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I think that uh, what Ola pointed out is uh, really true uh, on many uh, points. Uh, I, I think that the <clears throat> assume breach posture is really, really important to actually take in uh, because uh, this is true both for enterprise IT or admin IT, which is sometimes called, as well as for operational technology. Uh, and it's actually uh, from the fact uh, that uh, no software comes without vulnerabilities. There are no bulletproof software. So that means uh, all software can be exposed and uh, exploited. Um, new software as well as old software and uh, process control software. Uh, which is uh, quite old, as he pointed out. Um, so I think that is uh, also a major sort of uh, reflection that you have to have in mind uh, that uh, there's the, the world, uh, the technological world is not perfect in the, in the first place. Thank you for your, uh, your answer. Even if there is a, a legacy risk, the question I have to, to, to all of you is, is the power sector resilient enough to face new new cyber threats? And, and, and we, I would like to to hear first a reaction from an institutional perspective, probably with you, Felipe. Then from an energy sector perspective, will it be Justin and you, Tony. And then back to a digital perspective with uh, with Ole. So, Felipe, is the power sector? resilient enough to face new cyber threats? Okay, so yeah, thank you for that question. It's, it's a complex one, I guess, because it's, it has some terms inside that makes the question difficult to, to answer. I will focus on, on three uh, words that you said. No, the, for, the first one is what is resilient. And I would say by itself, uh, yes, the, the energy system, I think in, in particular in, in Europe, uh, it has a high level of resilience. So it's mature for years. There is a lot of um, mechanisms and instruments today that are built at national level, at, at a union level, no regional level, to make the, the, those those uh, systems relatively resilient. And, and the proof is is that there have been already incidents, not cybersecurity especially, but uh, generally speaking, incidents in energy and and the system recover. And cyber security incidents are just one subtype of uh, incidents that happen in energy. So it's ultimately we are talking about energy related incidents and cyber security are a part of them. So first resilient, yes, there is a level of resilience. Now, is enough? Uh, I think the answer is probably not and not always. So why? One of the reasons is, is cybersecurity comes into, into place more and more because more and more digitalization exists. So uh, it's probably not enough. And that means that from an institutional perspective as well, we need to, to think on, on, on what are the, the legislative mechanisms, instruments that exist, uh, how to make them evolve as well to, to adapt to, to what is going on in, in the industry, you know? and to make sure that uh, the combination of energy and cybersecurity, which are uh, two different worlds, and, and, and you know, at institutional level, there are different bodies, different entities dealing with that uh, in member states. No? How to make them work together? And, and this is uh, one of the challenges that exist today to make it resilient enough, as you were saying. No? And then the last word that I, I, I think is, is also key here is, is when you say new, uh, new, new cyber risks. I mean, nobody is really resilient enough to new cyber risks because uh, by the, the very definition of new, it makes it uh, a noun, no? But uh, what is, I think, the, the true is that uh, at, uh, at other levels today, there is an institutional push and, and clear, clear direction to make it more resilient and, and prepare for those that are new, new cyber by making it uh, really uh, from a technology perspective and from a, a legislative perspective to make and, and to produce the right instruments to anticipate uh, as much as possible those new cyber risks that you were mentioning. Thank you very much for, for your answer. May I ask you, Justin, the same question? Is the power sector resilient enough? 
Thanks very much for the question. Um, I, I think we have to recognise, as uh, other people have said, that there's an, a natural resilience within the, uh, the, the power system, the way it, it, it's designed, um, and that people have been spending a lot of time, effort and investment over the past decade or so to secure the existing systems, the, you know, our control rooms, our generation suites, our transmission and distribution systems. Um, however, um, and a lot of work, great work has been done. However, the threat landscape is changing all the time and is increasing. Um, so, and people are, uh, um, are focusing on some of the, the legacy technologies and the things that they hadn't been in the past. So, you know, the, the threat generally uh, is increasing. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing for me is the changes that are going to be happening to our energy system over the next five, 10 years. We've been spending quite a bit of time looking at the different elements of the, of the smart emerging and smart energy system, looking at what the cyber risk to those elements are now, what they are in five years and what they are in 10 years. And we think there's a lot of work that's needed to understand those risks by some of the new um, entrants into the market, entrants into the, uh, the overall all system. Um, it's already been mentioned about electric vehicles, um, but there's quite a lot of other changes that are coming down uh, the line for um, our future energy systems. So um, I think there's probably um, not enough focus um, and not enough in investment uh, and in, in terms of understanding what those risks are for the future. And that's where we, all, we need to really sort of step up um, our, our efforts, as well as of course, looking after our existing systems and our legacy uh, challenges. Thank you, Justin, for your, your answer. Back to you, Tony, in this changing landscape, what are your thoughts on uh, how the power sector, the resiliency of the power sector? Yeah, so uh, like uh, I have a quote from my boss, he says, uh, there, this is a challenge where you have to run extremely fast all the time just to maintain your position. So you run and run and uh, everything around you are uh, actually changing. And it was uh, you just in pointing out the threat uh, landscape, the threat picture, which is really gloomy and dark. And it's uh, very, very, um, how to say, if you look at the crime perspective, it's uh, going. Uh, it's it's so lucrative for those that uh, deal with and choose to be part of the the, the dark side. Uh, so it's um, that's of course a, a great challenge for all nation, uh, nations, and uh, uh, it's a challenge for all companies because they have to understand how does that threat landscape uh, get get into your uh, context. So that contextualization of your um, uh, risk posture, um, it's it's really challenging. Um, I think as a sector in whole, I mean, it, it depends on how you measure it really. Um, in Norway, I can say we are quite stable, even though the threat landscape is changing all the time. Uh, we do have the natural hazards that are, of course, sometimes uh, physically making us uh, unavailable to have the, the um, electricity uh, transported. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I mean, in general, I think that the, uh, the sector is um, uh, really uh, stepping up and uh, understanding the, 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 the value chain and the, the whole uh, ecosystem uh, around, uh, you know, coming from the close knit, um, very ring fenced uh, environments, IT environments and OT environments, and opening up uh, to the wilder world and internet as a as a carrier, uh, which we depend on more and more. So it's it's a lot about that awareness uh, that uh, things are changing and that you need to take it seriously. Uh, I see it for, from my perspective. I think that we in Norway take it quite seriously and uh, that the companies are stepping up to understand their risk uh, in this area. Thank you for your action. So last year, the European Commission released a proposal on a revised NIS directive 
And this new directive integrates more sector and more stakeholders, especially in the energy sectors. It means hydrogen, it means heating and cooling networks, it means charging station. And on the energy side, we strongly welcome these additions. A question to you, Felipe, working from the, the DG Energy at the European Commission. This new NIS directive provides for a general framework, but also sector specific approach. I would like to talk about the cybersecurity network code. As you know, the electricity sector has been working for months on the cybersecurity network code that has been decided under the energy regulation. And for the first time, DSOs through the newly uh, established DSO entity will be able to draft side by side by the TSO transmission system operator, the technical rules on cybersecurity aspect of cross-border electricity flows, which is a must to ensure a good quality of, uh, of supply and security of supply. So my question to you, Felipe, is why is this ele the electricity sector a priority for the DG energy? And what will be the benefit of this network code compared to the NICE directive? Thank you I mean, for this question. Indeed, indeed, this is one of the ongoing priorities today in, in DG energy and in particular in the electricity, is this network code. So why, to your question, why, why electricity is a priority? So I think the priority comes already from a, the, one of the key political priorities for the commission, for the current commission is the Green Deal. And it's not just a commission thing, it's, it's worldwide, I would say. We, we have had the COP26 now in the last week. And, and I think there is a common consensus that we need to decarbonize the, the energy, energy I mean, in society in general, but in particular in energy. Energy is one of the pillars for this Green Deal, and electricity is one, I mean, it's, it's probably the, 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 if not the, the most, it's the, one of the most important uh, sectors in, in energy that will help to decarbonize. I mean, it needs to decarbonize there, no? So that, that what is the relationship within, with uh, cybersecurity then? Is because to, to achieve this objective of decarbonizing, it has to, it, it's going digital. Digitalization is, is, is the key enabler Okay, to, to ensure that the electricity and not only electricity all other sectors will achieve the objectives mm -hmm. and technology is, is, is what makes this evolution uh, possible and when we talk about digitalization then uh, automatically we need to talk about uh, cyber security so so i would say the link is there from cyber security to the digitalization from the digitalization to, to the carbonization and the, and the overall green deal that we, we have so that's that's a priority uh, also, we have to acknowledge that the electricity sector probably today is the closest uh, to the to the digital world, in the sense that it, by its very nature, electricity is, is is the main the main way that digitalization happens as well. So there is a convergence there as well in the in the infrastructure. We were talking about IT and OT. It's converging. Uh, in many cases, we are talking now about devices that are both IT and IT, OT and IT. Sorry. So uh, their devolution uh, makes it also natural, no? And that's why this network code. This network code is a delegated act uh, from the electricity regulation. Mm -hmm. And uh, you spoke as well of the needs to the proposal uh, for the recast of the, the previous uh, NIS directive. Which is is coming from a different DG, is DG Connect, but it's, it's on the uh, it's the overarching, uh, I would say, cyber security directive um, in, in Europe, and this network code somehow links both in a way is that uh, the the network the, the network code is trying to to implement uh, these cyber security um, principles, but making them uh, specific to the electricity sector and specifically to the cross-border electricity flows. And this is the first of its kind under the, the clean energy package. And also, and I, I think it's very important what you said as well, uh, I mean, that uh, it's the uh, ENSO, I mean, the, the, the tra transmission system operators together with uh, the distributions with DSO, but not only, I mean, we have all of the actors as well. We have associations for renewables as well, and they are all participating in the drafting, in the, in the reviews now, which, which should, and that's what we hope really, 
uh, lead to, to a text that has a broad agreement and that, that should be fit for purpose, basically, this is the idea. No? Thank you. Thank you very much, Felipe. You can count on us. We are very much uh, committed to this network. It's a must for us. So we are working hard with the TSOs to, 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 to have it ready uh, on time. I will turn to, to the uh, energy sector representatives. Justin, with your experience on uh, utilities, for you, what will be the impact of this directive, the new one, and the cyber network code to uh, utilities. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, from I think the the first uh, NIS uh, directive was uh, vitally important to getting um, um, cyber resilience um, onto people's agendas and being embedded within organisations. Um, however, there were um, um, sort of some some gaps in that it it, 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 it uh, there was inconsistencies how how this was applied across member states um and it didn't get um um specific enough in cer certain areas um so i think this this um revised this second version um is 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 a, is a really uh, good idea um and it picks up on a lot of the areas which i mentioned previously that are changing in our energy system. Uh, NIS-1 was developed you know, back in 2016-ish, and the, the energy system changes um, have really emerged about what they will be now um, since then. Um, and I think this is having, uh, this will have a good, uh, uh, you know, a, a positive impact across, um, across the um, energy system. Um, in the UK, we took a slightly different approach to implementing the NIS directive. Um, a little bit more specific and a little bit more complete than um, um, many um, um, member states. Um, and I'm pleased to see that NIS 2 sort of builds on some of those aspects and brings those in. So I think um, particularly, you know, bringing in those other players, those other actors um, around the changing energy system, that is really good. And um, a lot of those are new entrants into this, uh, this business. Um, so I think they need to be thinking about doing things secure by design, not getting into a place where they're having to retrospectively um, add security um, after the event. Um, I think our existing operators um, will um, probably just have an uplift in what they're expected to do. Um, and I, I like the way the proposed um, uh, NIS 2 is focusing on governance and risk management rather than compliance. It's very much about understanding the risks that that particular um, operator or organization um, has and putting uh, the appropriate controls in there rather than a, a tick box approach to compliance, which is often uh, the case in, in security. I think it's also sort of got um, a really important element of strength, strengthening the security in the supply chain, uh, which can be very difficult in operational utilities. I'm working with some um, distribution network operators at the moment that actually tracking through the, the, the uh, complexities within their supply chain, particularly in the telecoms area, um, is actually quite a challenge. And this is going to be more and more of a challenge as we go for a, a smarter energy system. So I think there's, um, there's, there's, there's still going to be quite a lot more to do um, for, the, um, for existing operators that are, are complying with, with NIRS, but also the new operators that were either weren't in scope or are new entrants. I think they're going to find that a particular challenge. And I'd very much recommend about uh, thinking about what those risks are and what those implications are early on in their design life cycle. So, Tony, as a, as a major generator of renewable energy, right now, how do you concretely implement and ensure the cyber security of your generation units? Okay, so Remy, uh, just to make it clear, uh, I work in the Statcraft and we are not a grid operator or a net company. We come in early in the ecosystem. Uh, we produce uh, renewable power from hydro, wind and sun sources. And we produce quite a lot of it, 65 terawatt hours per, per year. 
Uh, and we uh, handle more than or operate and maintain 370 uh, power plants around the world. So we are um, partly uh, under this legislation. Uh, and just to um, um, make it clear, we are headquartered in Norway. And uh, Norway is uh, not a, f a member of EU. Uh, and um, uh, we are part of the wider European economic area. So um, the laws that or the, the directives that is um, um, adopted in EU, they are not binding for us. We have to take it into our own legislation. And believe it or not, the NIS directive is not formally adopted in Norway yet. And neither is this too. <laughs> so this makes it interesting from a legislation point of view. Um, however, so that's sort of the bad news. Uh, so, but we operate in 18 countries and we are of course obliged uh, by the local law in, in all of these countries. And uh, at the moment we uh, are um, required to be certified against uh, the, an ISO standard called ISO 2701 information security management system which actually sets the direction the management processes the the governance the internal control um yeah the the um, the whole bit really from a process uh, point of view and uh, as a company we are obliged to um uh, abide by that um or we are actually required to be certified against iso 2701 uh, for now, we are uh, required to do that in Germany, uh, in Turkey, and uh, soon in Albania, which has taken this into their own um, legislation to regulate the critical national infrastructure that we are part of. Uh, but the good thing is that uh, Norway thought about this a long time ago, and uh, when they established the Norwegian Energy Act, uh, which goes back actually to the 1990s, and uh, what we see when we read that act and the uh, following up, um, uh, what you call, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the additions to the to the act, is that they follow very closely up with uh, the intention of the NIST directive, both the NIST one and NIST two, and um, they build on the NIST, NIST uh, the CIS uh, controls and the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, to have uh, your baseline and uh, how, how to set up secure environments. So I think that uh, answers some of the, the questions you had. Uh, to be operating in many jurisdictions, that is the challenge really to find what is the baseline, how, how, how high should the barrier be in, uh, in the enterprise and uh, what do you need to add on in the local uh, jurisdiction. So this is uh, interesting to see now what the Norwegian government will do regarding this this one and this two, if they will adopt it. I, I'm sure they will because usually they adopt everything that's coming from EU, uh, but so far they haven't uh, taken it into the to the, the legislation of uh, Norway. Thank you, and we will carefully look at what is going on in Norway regarding the adoption or not. But I'm sure they will uh, of the NIST directive. From an NAD's point of view and an NAD's side, it will not be a surprise. We do consider that all stakeholders who exposure to cybersecurity threats can significantly impact the grid should be subject to cyber requirement, even the smallest one. So we, we have been a bit disappointed by uh, the NICE revision on, the, on this point. Considering the of the energy sector, we need, for us at least, to adopt a collective approach uh, instead of uh, a size-based approach. That's why we do ask uh, for uh, a global and a common global and common requirements in terms of, of cybersecurity. Considering the increase of cybersecurity attacks of the whole supply chain, the addition of the supply chain to the scope is a new outcome of the revised directive. So Felipe, could you uh, further elaborate uh, a bit on this and, and give us the, the, the spirit of the DG on, uh, on this topic? 
Okay, Th thank you, Remy. Yes, indeed, indeed, this is one of the the evolution that is happening today. It's not as particular to 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 this sector or to to the Commission, but I think supply chain risks uh, are somehow, in a way, it's a trendy word, but it's, it's really the evolution of what has happened in the in the in the last years, and how the the th the threat vector, in a way, you know, how how those uh, cybersecurity risk um, materialize no, in, in, in the different environments. The, the supply chain is, is one of the key key vectors that are using. No? We had the case on, on solar winds, no? uh, it was the most famous no? and visible. There are many others. It is not new in a way. So I think the, also the, the concept behind the supply chain is there for, for already some time. I think that's here Ole from Microsoft language world it was the same now for for many years there has been the the idea of providing this life cycle of, of software and digital uh, infrastructure through regular uh, updates how to deploy uh, software how to uh, how to maintain the software is already there but now the evolution of technology and the evolution of um, cybersecurity has led to a situation where where th these actors are, are exploiting the weaknesses in the supply chain and then what I think is also interesting to say, I think it's a beautiful term no? in, in, in the domain we are talking because in the past years, I don't think we heard much about the, the notion of supply chain and so on. Now we are hearing that and almost we are getting used to it in a way that uh, all, we all speak of supply chain. Well, actually it was, it was more for industrial aspects. And here we are in a sector in energy and cyber security where we are talking cyber security, digital and industry. And then we see eh, how this, this term, in a way, for me, I don't know if it's coincidence or not, but in, in a way, it brings already, uh, in a semantic way, the convergence of these two worlds, which I think is more and more, and by the way, in, at, at a legislative uh, level, we have these two, but there is the, the directive on um, resilience, no? and it is, which is also a, is, is, is this combination of hybrid threats, physical and, and digital threats. So we see that the evolution of the society is, is going to, to that, the industry is going to that, to, to a situation where we have both worlds uh, impacting no? the, the reliability of, of our grid, of our system. And, and this is just an evolution of that and legislation uh, as any, anywhere is just mimicking in a way, no? anticipating sometimes, but most of the times it's going along with the evolution of what is happening. Thank you, Felipe. You, we, we very much welcome the adaptation of, of the legislation uh, facing uh, more and more cyber attacks. Ole, if I may come back to you as a software supplier, what are your thoughts on, on, on this, uh, this matter of supply chain? Thanks, Remy. Uh, yeah, um, I think um, I, I want to bring back some of what Tona said uh, about uh, certification and also the NIS uh, 1 and 2 directive. And, and one of the, the challenge for supply chain uh, could, in many cases, be small companies without the resources to, to actually go through this uh, certification or, as Justin said, risk management approach to, to how they build in their system. And yeah, I can talk for Microsoft in this case. And I think use of cloud computing will help these smaller specialized companies because in Microsoft, for instance, we have plus 95 different certification plus for a lot of industries. We have for healthcare, we have for, uh, for um, bank and finance, et cetera but also all the ISO, ISO 27001, 27017, 27, you, you mentioned it. And all customer will benefit from that kind of certification. And you have like a shared responsibility model where you have an 80, 20 in general, um, where 80% of the full ISO is taken care by a vendor like us. And you have us, easier way to actually get your certification in place uh, on team you control as a customer as a vendor it's like access control it's like your data labeling classification of data what is important for us what is not important for us um, while the rest is actually taken care of from 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 the cloud and the vendor you're selecting in the cloud i know for sure what microsoft are but i also know that our competitor have 
more or less the same approach to it. Um, that means you're getting a lot of security processes, certifications out of the box compared to to run everything from from zero to 100 yourself. And that is important for like Statcraft or the huge organization to have resources, have money, have people to actually go through all this. But they also depend on smaller vendors, they depend on, on uh, other vendors that actually can benefit for using what already are in place. That was a bit product uh, talk up of some product, but I, I honestly mean it as well. Thank you for, uh, for, for your comments. Uh, really interesting when it comes to smallest vendor, especially for in front of a uh, big companies and, 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 and big utilities. Only uh, may I ask the other panelists if you have additional comments or, or thoughts you would like to, to share with us on this uh, supply chain topic, or should we move to the, to, to the next question? Okay, so if, if you allow me just a, a first reaction also to, to this concept of cloud that Oliver was mentioning right now, because I think it's, it's really also very important. This is again, another evolution of technology that is also not new this year, but it's, it's re recent. And this uh, brings uh, additional um, challenges no, to, to this, to cybersecurity as well, but it's beyond cybersecurity, it's, it's uh, interoperability, no? and, and how to make sure that uh, when you have uh, technology that is from vendors that uh, are relying or, or linking different different actors, different companies, different industries in the market, like in, in Europe, where the internal market is is uh, is one of the main rules. It's how to make sure that uh, you make this interoperable, and then as a consequence eh, of this interoperability, is how to make uh, these interoperable systems secure. Which brings again another layer no, of of, uh, of of challenge no, to, to to this to this area. No? Yeah. So my uh, reaction is uh, I very much uh, agree with my previous uh, speaker, this previous speakers. I think that uh, the supply chain aspect is uh, really important, and uh, that uh, uh, what would be good, I think, is uh, increase the regulation for suppliers to the industry and to the sector. Um, I, I have uh, previously worked in the financial sector, and uh, they are more. Uh, they have been more heavily regulated within this domain, uh, cybersecurity and information security. And uh, what they have done is a lot of good practice in the sector. Um, when it comes to, for instance, uh, penetration testing, that uh, you need actually to perform penetration testing before you can. Uh, um, actually use a system and you have accreditation on uh, the penetration test testing method. Uh, in the UK you have something called the, um, the, the CREST uh, presentation um, standard and uh, I think that this is the way probably the energy sector should also look, look at uh, to get some inspiration of how we uh, together can uh, raise the barrier and make it more uh, tough and hard for the bad guys. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, I think, also good for the the supply chain, uh, the yeah, your uh, providers, security providers. Thank you. Uh, I keep that making hard for the bad guys. Uh, I like this uh, this sentence. Um, Justin, if I may come back to you for your sector of activities what are the main opportunities and the main challenges in the coming years when it comes to cyber security well i think there are many challenges uh, but the biggest one i think is just keeping up with um, the changes so the changes in threats and protecting the legacy and keeping up with the changing um, um, energy system um, as we go to a more um, um, you know, distributed energy, flexible um, 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 system with new um, capabilities such as aggregation and demand side response. All of that is going to be quite a, a complicated journey um, over the, the next decade. Um, but I don't want to make sound negative about all of this uh, because I think there are some fantastic opportunities here. 
Um, and all of that is, is really around the digital enablement of the energy system by getting cybersecurity right. If you get that right across the IT side and the OT side and the IoT side of things, um, then that gives you some great uh, capabilities in being able to liberate stranded data that can be used for optimization of the system, flexibility of, of services um, and, and the like. Um, and I think that, that actually this is a really, really key topic in enabling our, our growth to net zero and the decarbonization of the energy and also the transport sectors as well. So I really do feel that this is a, a, you know, a good thing for humankind. Um, and often as cybersecurity professionals in energy, we get focused in on the day job and the current system. And I think it's important to look at that wider picture and the benefits that we can get out of this. And it's not just about compliance. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your, for your answer. On the uh, energy side, uh, our main challenge is definitely ensuring what we call the continuum of trust. Means that to maintain customers' trust, we, entities and the whole value chain must be cyber secure. So it's our main challenge. On the same time, in the meantime, our main opportunity is definitely the cooperation. First, cooperation within the energy sector. That's what we do, drafting the network code and also cooperation with other sectors. You mentioned it, uh, Justin, like uh, the transport sector with the charging station, the, the new EV cars, connected EV cars. So challenge for us, continuum of trust, opportunity for us, cooperation. If I may come back to you, Felipe, very shortly, what are your expectations towards the energy sectors when it comes to this uh, cybersecurity topic? Okay, thank you. So, yes, as closing words, maybe I'm going to echo your own words, uh, Remy, is cooperation. I think this is uh, from the Commission. What we see is that in this domain, uh, through different directives, but also this network code, for example, it is paramount uh, to have the input from, from, all, from all different actors. Uh, the sensitive, sensibilities of each uh, is, is, are different, the, the needs, the concerns, the requirements are, are slightly different. But the, the good thing and the good news is, is that all have the objective and all, everybody wants to be more cyber secure. So uh, we share the objective, not always the, the, the starting point and the requirements are the same, but through this uh, collaboration, through this sharing of information, uh, we do believe that uh, all instruments from, from uh, in, like legal, I mean, from legislative instruments down to, to operational practices, uh, this, this, we can improve the resilience of the of the power of the, of the grid. So this is for us the main, I would say, the main expectation now towards the power sector within the the legislative activity that the Commission is, is undertaking now. We are reaching the, the end of this uh, passionating roundtable and discussion about cybersecurity. Let me first thank you all, all of you, for this, uh, those really, this really interesting discussion. Uh, no doubt that we have all cybersecurity in mind. It's a, it's, it's a must. It's definitely not an option. Even if, uh, and I will conclude on that, even if the energy landscape has incredibly changed over the past year, the main goal of the power sector has not changed, it's still the same, ensuring the electricity uh, supply and providing European citizens, let's say the wide Europe, including Norway, with the highest uh, quality of service. However, the tweets to the networks have changed. There are no multiples, they are hybrid, and that's why we need to ensure the resiliency of the grid, we have to, to put this as our top priority. This is what we do. All of us, uh, DSOs, TSOs, uh, consulting company, of course, the commission, uh, generators as well. We are definitely on, on track. As I said before, nobody is safe for a cyber attack. Cascading effects must be prevented as well in order to maintain a trust continuum 
between all actors of the value chain and ensuring at the end the electricity continuum which is why we are we are there as a utility so thanks thanks a lot thank you very much for this uh, interesting discussion feel free to react on the social media using the hashtag digitopia and the hashtag electric decade thank you thanks very much remy for that fascinating panel and thanks also to francis for moderating the previous panel thanks to our expert speakers and panelists and thanks also to our partners microsoft google landerson gear and sas if you'd like to follow the discussion and even join the platform, please do look on Euroelectric website and look for Beyond Digital Platform. And follow us on social media using the hashtags, hashtag Digitopia21 and hashtag Electric Decade. Glad you enjoyed it and hope to see you soon at future Euroelectric events. Thank you and goodbye.